I think that is it. I got to say, I'm not, this weather, I'm not feeling it. I wish I were. The weather? I, no, the podcast. I'm, um, like, I want to feel it. I look cute. You do. Y'all look cute. We need to do so it. Much. No. Let's try. Okay. We're going to do it. Okay. Zebra mom. I'm wearing a side pony today. Just for it. And, and a cute zebra striped shirt. Sweater. It's adorable. Mm -hmm. it's I'm in the wrong animal. That's okay. I'm not in an animal. <laughs> you are the animal. How did you know what I was thinking in my head? Um, yeah, we don't care. Magic. Magic, yeah. <laughs> Genetic similarities. <laughs> oh, shall I just start then? Hi, welcome to the Hacking Hypermobility Podcast. You may remember at the end of season one last year, we kind of closed out with all things wrap up from 2022, but this year we decided to start off and we're going to do a comprehensive review of all things Ehlers Danos syndrome in 2023. So, what do you think, Luna? And you know what I love is that you're you're wearing the pink zebra stripe sweater that you got. So, if you are just listening to the podcast, pop over to the video version on YouTube so you can see. Yes, um, I also have matching nine. leg warmers that I knitted. And we did not plan this, but we were both wearing pink, which is mm -hmm. which is funny to me. I'm usually wearing a funny t-shirt. It's true. Yeah. But I'm yeah. I I it's cold. It's snowing. It, it is it is the great snow day snowstorm of January 2024. So yeah. It's been a year of breakthroughs, discoveries, and advanced advancements for hypermobility, though. So I've got a lot to share for the 2023 year in review. Are you ready to start the wrap up? Yeah, let's get this pony on the road. That's not so, the right thing. <laughs> it's a zebra. Let's get the zebra on the road. Yeah. It's not, is that a saying? <laughs> I, I think I was confusing and combining something about a show pony or a one trick pony and a show on the road. I think, I think. <laughs> it was mixed metaphors. It was such a lot a, of different. Such it a tism thing. We don't know our metaphors. We don't know what we're trying to say. But I understood you. Yeah. Okay. Remind me so to I'm tell you about the beef hole later. And I'm just going to leave it at that. And you're going to be like, did she just say beef hole? Yes, I said beef hole. Okay. Well, um, so the medical publication and news from 2023 is very encouraging to hypermobile humans. Much of the research was, for me, validating our emotional experience and comorbidities as zebras. I think that's a really important shift in medical research that we're expanding uh, what we are examining for the community. So a defining moment from last year for me was from Dr. Colin Halverson of the Center for Bioethics out of Indiana University School of Medicine. And IU does have an EDS clinic, by the way, um, who published a qualitative study on the EDS syndromes and coined an apt phrase in this publication called clinician associated traumatization <laughs> so we've named it now yeah. um in 2023 the medical professionals that um think like that and did put effort towards case studies and medical research propelled not only our understanding of the biological causes of the ehlers samuel syndromes but also how this affects our life and possibilities for improving our quality of life so that's a that's a good shift. I think that's a very positive note looking back at the research and trends from the medical community. Awareness campaigns and visibility were helped by monetary donations to research organizations such as the EDS Society. And our hope is that by 
sharing the experience of hypermobile humans with you here on the show, our listeners will help engage by sharing our work and getting as excited as we do to continue the momentum of the zebra herd because it takes all of us getting our zebras on the road. The ponies. Um, the community has been a buzz about several new genetic discoveries, uh, but there's so much more than just that. Um, several new case studies and publications on comorbid conditions with EDS were published this year in the medical literature. Um, but there's also been a productive shift towards looking towards therapeutic options for managing EDS. Our first stop is the realm of cutting edge research. A standout study explored novel genetic markers associated with the specific subtypes of EDS. Researchers uncovered a wealth of information offering a more refined understanding of the complex genetic landscape of EDS. Absolutely, Shelley. We have always said in our conversations that it's a spectrum of hypermobility, the same as we think of neurodivergency as a spectrum. Knowing the genetic nuances, though, is like having a treasure map to the underlying causes. Uh, it's a significant stride towards uh, precision medicine for EDS, which we don't really have. So here's a summary of some of just the key publications looking into the genetics and biology that came out in 2023. So the first one is from the UK, the study titled the genetic complexity of diagnostically unresolved Ehlers-Danlos syndrome showed the value of doing full genetic panels. They call it whole exome sequencing to diagnose complex cases of EDS, and they identified more of a genetic basis for the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. So the researchers at the user University of Edinburgh shared the results of full genetic testing in 147 EDS patients in the UK. That's a very large cohort for an EDS study, by the way. Um, I was wondering, because the previous study we mentioned, they said they talked to like 26 people. Or was It seemed abnormally low, and I was like, really? Most but of then... the EDS studies are pretty small. Now, the not to sidetrack, but the Hedge study has a much larger patient base and is taking much longer um, to publish. So we're looking for more information. This is kind of like a, pr a little preview. This is a smaller data set, but one of the bigger data sets we've had of full genomes. So this so-called whole exome sequencing is looking at our full strand of DNA. And they shared some new genes not currently associated with um, EDS or the heritable thoracic aortic disease. Interestingly, that they are studying both because I do not think they can be separated as a patient of both. The newly identified genes that are associated with EDS-like syndromes, but awaiting confirmation are linked in the show notes. There, there's a list of some genes you can compare if you have your own Ooh. genetic research or want to share with your doctor. A second study is much more controversial, came out of Tulane University. Yes, I was um, wondering if we were going to talk about this one. I'm going to bring it up. So the paper proposed a, quote, folate-dependent hypermobility syndrome, end quote. There's not a lot of concrete evidence that was provided on the use of vitamin B9 supplementation, but there have, there have been a lot of um, anecdotal reports, uh, even outside of this study, that folate supplementation and knowledge of the MTHFR impacts on hypermobile humans is important. However, that doesn't necessarily mean causation. And the Louisiana Clinic's uh, public endorsement of a particular brand of supplements makes it even more questionable. So, yeah. but you know, there's anecdotal evidence from patients and it's encouraging and it can help some of us. And, you know, we both have the MTHFR mutations. Mm -hmm. And so like once I knew that, and I, did I had subclinical no. low, like mm -hmm. folate and yeah. B12 and had to do shots yeah. and supplementation yes, in, and like 10 years well. ago. So, yeah. yeah. So it's important to know in the context of your care, but the concern is we're going to get sucked into thinking that's the cause of hypermobility right. syndromes. That's, that's the criticism. The third study that I think is important. Also, that Tulane paper is not a comprehensive study. It was just kind of an article of publication without a ton of research 
data. Like there's not data sets to support all yeah. this. Yeah. Like you might it's have heard conclusive. about it, which is why we're talking about it. It was it's more of an opinion piece. Mm -hmm. In my it opinion. wasn't peer reviewed, right? It was not no, and it was never yeah. peer reviewed. It, yeah. And but people ran with it. So this third study, they found a mutation on the MIA3 gene from a woman in Poland as part of a larger study, and they deemed it as a likely cause of her diagnosis of hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome heads, which is, we know, is the more common form of EDS. And through global research, we gained a better understanding of vascular EDS or VEDS, first with a study from Japan on collagen fibrils. Also of note was a discovery from South Korea on two new VEDS genetic variants. Oh. And a study from here in the States at the University of North Carolina that explored the role of VEDS mutations in blood vessel mechanics and on the differences in extracellular matrix fibroblasts. So there's some interesting uh, genetic um, understandings that are expanding, yeah. particularly in the past year. Yeah. So it sounds like the UK study was the one that might be the biggest one of the year with like the new genetic findings. But you said there were other advancements outside of research and to the genetic causes. So what were those? Like what, like treatments or? Yeah, I think that Edinburgh study is really important and very interesting. Definitely go look in the show notes to see if it matches any of your DNA or share that with your doctor if you've been tested. I think it gives us. Might be a fun little side project for us to do. Yeah. I think also that study points out the value of full panel genetic testing when you're talking about a group of syndromes that's not very well understood yet. I think it's important that we as a community get more and more data to understand this better. So I, I love that study. But the medical community has been looking into ways to help treat patients like us also. Um, so let's talk about the strides made in clinical protocols. This year, the effort to move towards better diagnostic tools that provide more accurate and timely assessments for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome has made some headway. So if we can improve awareness and the diagnostic process, medicine may also pave the way for more personalized treatment plans. Yeah, well, precision and early diagnosis is key to navigating this whole hypermobility puzzle. So these advancements are likely upgrading our navigation system for a smoother journey into these complexities as we take this pony down the road, right? So the diagnostic and genetic parts of research often forget what patients need though, which is help with managing the disorder. So what have we yeah, come up with? The very first medical protocol for EDS, meaning this is how doctors have a set way of handling a particular medical issue, came from Heads Together which is in the UK. And the first medical protocol was actually maternity tools for HEDS patients. And that was born of researching of research only in 2019. So it's very recent that we even started having clinical protocols for HEDS or EDS. We still have such a long way to go, but I want to remind you of that resource. If you do own a uterus, I'll link it in the show notes. HEDS Together is currently working on several other projects to expand these tools for clinicians. Um, they're working on projects on POTS as well as shoulder issues. Oh. Um, advancement in clinical protocols in the past year included more research on our daily life. It's definitely been a global effort. It's not just happening here in the States or UK. Say a small French study is very interesting. They did a nine week rehabilitation program for patients with hypermobile Ehlers Danlos syndromes, and it really supports its effectiveness. And so that would be very useful for you to take in with your physical medicine doctors, PT, OT, and it, it supports intensive inpatient rehab for us, which is interesting. Patient. Yeah, like they are, like, you know how you go in and you do rehab after a major well, surgery. Yeah, or but it's like, kind of like that. But like, okay. Intensive, yeah. So I don't know that we would really want to be inpatient necessarily, but that's basically what they do. It was highly focused, you know, gradual rehabilitation mm -hmm. over nine weeks, which is a long time. Another study study shows promise with the practice of mindfulness on improving our quality of life. Even compression garments were studied, which you know might support coverage and payment from insurance, for example. 
And a study showed using compression in conjunction with physical therapy improved our balance and proprioception better than therapy alone. Mm. A lot of studies were done on temporomandibular dysfunction, TMJ, jaw pain, and EDS. They also linked irritable bowel syndrome or IBS and heads. And there were a couple different studies on throat problems, speech, um, swallowing difficulties, that sort of thing. And then even breathing issues were examined and it was implicated that our breathing issues affect our mental health, which I have been saying for quite a while. So there have been quite a few interesting things studied, and there's been a trend in several things being studied more in depth, such as the TMJ and my That whole list was issues. like all of my issues. Yeah, like it's, it the seems TMJ, like it's the a, swa- uh, like, it's like did, just really a list. Like, yeah. let's take a list of Shelley's problems, and now we're going to... Remember how I said <laughs> these were very validating? I I mean you're not wrong. Uh, yeah. So wow, I wasn't like speechless, which is unusual for someone <laughs> well, such as myself. Speaking of advancements, game-changing focus on studies that were looking into unraveling the intricate relationship between EDS and related conditions called comorbidities, um, as well as our experience with medicine. So Finding shed light on often overlooked aspects of EDS, influencing both diagnosis and symptom management. So that's really nice that we're kind of pulling pulling back our perspective to see this as a complex systemic problem. Yeah, but it's like discovering a new dimension. It's like now it's like three dimensional puzzle. So like understanding mm-hmm. all of these nuances does bring us one step closer to like being able to cons- comprehensively address all of these challenges that we face like individually but mm-hmm. more varied and helpful medical research and case studies has been published so give us the breakdown on those yeah there have been a lot of studies on spinal fusion surgery which has particular meaning to my family uh yeah my my family too So three publications had conflicting outcomes, though. Two showed spinal fusion has complications, but another study on SI joint fusion had great outcomes. In general, I would say if you are working with an orthopedist, a spine specialist to examine if you're a candidate for spinal fusion, definitely just bring up these studies with your physician. But it seems like it's still a worthwhile and helpful option at a certain point for zebras. Sensory nerve blocks were studied, but just in mouse models, and that could be promising for neuropathic pain. A retrospective study of HEDS patients showed successful outcomes after breast surgery, and many of us complain about pain and that sort of thing with our breasts as we age, not just necessarily a cosmetic procedure, and then several study of vascular EDS in particular mean it was looking at high risk conditions associated with the vascular type. So they expanded their knowledge on VEDS complications. Also, pregnancy and birth outcomes were studied in a very large data set, nationally represented analysis of the US. They looked at over five million births. Wow. In, including over a thousand births to EDS families. So that is another very interesting um, data analysis study. COVID-19 and Ehlers-Danlos syndromes were studied further, which, as you know, I have been obsessed with that that overlap from the very beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, dermatology and ophthalmology presentations were studied. Gastrointestinal symptoms and nutrition was studied. Which is so interesting to me that we're now finally looking at, okay, well, what can we do with nutrition, supplement options, that sort of thing? It's nice for them to be looking at, you know, yes, EDS doesn't have a cure, but that doesn't mean we're not impacted by all of these things that Mm -hmm. still need treatment. Like, Exactly. So what can we do? Right. So it's it's nice that they're, again, validation, like you said. And so much of the research looked into how various medical conditions that interplay with hypermobility and EDS, including the study on dysautonomia, hypermobility spectrum disorders, and mast cell activation syndrome as migraine comorbidities. I love when the pieces start to come together. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was 
a study on fibromyalgia, a study on small fiber neuropathy, a study on functional neurological disorders, and a pain study that all um, took into account um, hypermobility. And those are very, you know, helpful towards those of us that need therapeutic guidance and options. Yeah. There were also several new case studies in publications on comorbidities, you know, that were published in the medical literature, but there's been this productive shift towards looking at those therapeutic uh, options to manage EDS and creative approaches towards caring for hypermobile humans. Understanding our condition is one thing, of course, we want to know what causes it, but managing our lives is another one. That's why we're here. That's why we called it hacking hypermobility. Yeah. Um, switching gears, let's talk about the rise of patient-centric approaches, this shift. So this year, there's a notable increase to me in initiatives empowering individuals with EDS to proactively participate in their care plans and for medicine to take a more multidisciplinary approach. So from virtual support communities to accessible educational resources, the focus on patient empowerment is shaping a more connected EDS community. Yes, empowerment really is the key to navigating this journey with EDS. The sense of community and shared knowledge is like having a reliable co-pilot on this complex voyage. So um, a remarkable approach has been to recognize this the intersectionality of medical trauma and overlaps with the neurobiological differences. Awareness has slowly been increasing with the overlap of the other neurodevelopmental differences, such as ADHD and autism spectrum disorder, um, both of which um, go on in my brain. Um, we discussed this last year after the publication of Luna's favorite, the connective ohm theory. But truly, this initiative came from within the community. Another overlap noted first within our patient communities is now being recognized by the medical community, and that came from Kansas City. This study looked into a higher numbers of transgender and gender non-conforming pediatric patients in the pediatric EDS population and concluded that increased awareness of TGD and gender non-conforming comorbid presentations in patients with EDS is needed. The researchers suggested this high rate may prompt specialists at other clinics to proactively ask about gender identity, noting that appropriate gender-affirming medical care can substantially improve mental health and reduce the risk of suicidality. As care for those with EDS is often complex and multidisciplinary, providers should take consideration to ask relevant screening questions to identify gender identity and to ensure gender-affirming healthcare environments that contribute to the improved care and outcomes they saw. Yeah, so we've beat the drum pretty hard about like, hey, you really need to consider the overlaps between neurodivergencies and hypermobility syndromes like EDS. But, you know, a big part of the overlap that's overlooked a lot of the time or maybe not supported are the things that people consider just in the mental health realm. And that is heavily discouraging, really, because if we better identify things like that and support, you know, differences proactively like that and get affirming care to our kids, then yeah. they have a better chance holistically. So a, a, another trend in the studies was, of course, the conclusion how much more research is needed. You know, like that particular study and others really is coming from knowledge within the community. But a key example or a key aspect of our well being dealing with complex systemic disorders such as EDS um, is that we're frequently late diagnosed and under supported in mental health. So there was actually a scoping review looking into psychological interventions among patients diagnosed with EDS and joint hypermobility syndromes. And their conclusion is this, there is a critical need for high quality research surrounding psychological interventions for individuals with EDS slash HSD. Psychological interventions for these individuals are understudied and existing studies lack validity. Researchers should investigate psychological interventions for individuals with all types of EDS and HSD with high quality studies to validate the findings from existing studies. Now, that may seem a little demoralizing to see how much remains 
unknown or undefined and how much of an impact mental health has on our community. But some definitive things came out of 2023, however. I, I see, it feels like it's shifting slowly. Yeah. yeah, I would say this was the year that, you know, kind of shifted some things in a really good direction, particularly in pediatrics. Well, I don't follow pediatrics as closely as you, but let's go ahead and take a zoom in on the pediatric joint hypermobility syndrome. So the gra a groundbreaking change was the creation of a diagnostic framework to begin identifying hypermobile children. So we're going to do a whole episode on this topic later in the season, but go ahead and give us a high level info dump on that, Luna. So yes, of course, this is part of our community that's very near and dear to my heart, but the classification of hypermobility was expanded in this past year and in some ways restricted um, based on age and developmental stage, um, but I still see this development as positive overall. We hope to see pediatric strategies now tailored to the unique needs of individuals with hypermobility and early intervention and support. So the new research and diagnostic tools for pediatric joint hypermobility was published in May of 2023. We'll put links in the notes, of course. This expanded classification was born of the work of a large international expert group that met for two years from 2020 through 2022. And under the new diagnostic guidelines, children with generalized joint hypermobility can fit into one of the following eight categories of um, subtypes, depending on the presence of musculoskeletal complications, skin and tissue abnormalities, and comorbidities. Actually, I'm not going to go through all eight. I'll just link to it. Yeah. There's a there's a list, um, okay. depending on severity of presentation. So there are now some differences between adult and pediatric diagnostic guidelines for hypermobile EDS. Uh, basically, prepubescent children cannot be diagnosed with pets under the new guidelines that are dependent on age and symptoms. So, you know, of course, hmm. my criticism on that is they very well may be a HEDS patient or another type of inherited connective tissue disorder. Right, patient. that's so like, okay, you have to let's wait till puberty. Again when you're an adult. Yeah, so I think that makes it even, that that does not improve accessibility, but I do see it, we're moving in the right direction because it may improve access to care. All right, so of course, all of this takes money. So advancements like these move more swiftly when money like donations and grants from institutions and organizations backing this type of research flows, right? So the EDS Society has get, received significant monetary grants this year, this year, meaning 2023, including 6.7 million from the Mike and Sophia Seagal Foundation. Is it Seagal or Siegel? I'm not sure. They're Ukrainian immigrants, so it's probably a soft egg. Yeah. Um, and a $2.375 million pledge from in vitro cell research, LLC, also known as ICR, was to contribute to the hedge study, which is that huge study we mentioned earlier, and that's to target future drug development. So those are some pretty large numbers. That's a significant amount of money. I will say, though, if you look at funds that go into other um, medical research uh, areas, that's, that's very small. But those are large numbers for EDS. I think the most important trend I've noticed, though, in the last year in the medical community seems to be listening to hypermobile humans. And we can see that in the momentum. Yeah. <sighs> wow. So we, we went a little lighter on our year end wrap up, and I'm grateful for that. Yeah. Um, what a year. What a year it has been for in the world of the Ehlers-Danlos syndromes. Right. From genetic revelations to patient and power initiatives, 2023 has kind of been a big deal for us hypermobile humans. So stay tuned because we're going to do a follow-up episode, part two, to this review, and we'll delve into a recap of neurodivergence news. Yes. Yeah, so see, we tricked you. We made it sound like it was going to be shorter, but it's really just going to be two episodes. So thank you so much for listening to Hacking Hypermobility podcast today. We hope you will engage with us on social media and in your own communities to help 
these efforts. Uh, if you learn something new, share it with someone. Um, if you've got these issues, you probably have talked to a friend about it or someone, share it with them. They might have learned something new. Yes. And will you please, please take a moment, wherever you're listening, um, to share this episode, click follow, leave us a review, engage with us on the socials. Um, and until next time, remember to stay informed, stay connected, and keep hacking the hypermobility puzzle. Also, if any of these topics sparked ideas or questions and you want to hear us discuss something specific, send us a message to our email at info at hackinghypermobility.com. And tag us on socials too. And a quick disclaimer, the information provided in this podcast episode is for educational purposes only and should not be considered as medical advice. Consult with healthcare professionals for personal guidance by managing Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. Thanks again for listening. That was very professional, Shelley. Have a great day, Zebras. <laughs> Wishing you have. Bye. <laughs>